Whoa, I'll tell you what, Happy New Year. What a night. Should have seen Oliver. Nutcase on the dance floor. I'm going to need some of this, I reckon, to get me through this one. As ever, you know the drill. If you've got yourself a tech-related problem, leave it for me down there in the comment section below, and I'll do my very best to try and solve it. Right. Crack on, then. The first one this week comes in from Michael Alice, who says, Can you tell us, please, if spending more on aftermarket or even standard Shimano Durace cables and guide sets or gear sets really make a difference. Thanks for the great info, Mike. Michael, love this question. I absolutely obsess over uh, brakes and their smoothness and the quality of it. Gears, not so much, because these days they're pretty all, you know, they're all good, and actually I use electronics, so a bit of a confession there. But when it comes to braking, um, most cable sets when they're new, tend to be pretty good, right? So there are a few like, you know, shoddy ones. And if you're paying peanuts, you're not gonna get great ones, let's face it. But, you know, if you're buying Durace ones, you are gonna get really, really good quality brake cables and gear cables. The back brake is always the one which seems to be affected most. Normally it's because of the cable routing and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, I would always actually re recommend using a higher quality uh, cable set. Sometimes it can be, you know, a little bit harder to swallow if you like when you see the price of them compared to those entry level ones, but I believe the difference, you know, is actually there. My favorite ones actually out there have to be the Jaguar. I think they're called the Elite Link system. Well, something like this from Jaguar can save yourself a lot of aggro when you're out on the bike because they're super flexible because the actual cables themselves are linked up. Each individual piece is joined together, which allows you to have a super flexible run of cable because inside of there, you've got a liner which your inner cable run, runs through and essentially allows you to route it oh so perfectly. In my my opinion anyway. Uh, now they come in a variety of different colours here too and you can even save yourself a bit of weight on them too because the shift, leave, shift cables you're going to save about 20% over a traditional cable and for braking 50%. Add that up over a bike and that's quite a lot of weight you could save for probably not quite a lot of money. But yeah quality cables does make a massive difference. Right, next up is Joshua Picari, who says, I've got Chris King R45 hubs and would like to swap out the bearings for some nice NTN ones, preferably not angular contact. What size bearings would I need and is it possible or has Chris King locked me into their bearings? Not possible, right? So Chris King bearings are actually made by Chris King themselves, or actually sometimes probably by Chris King himself too. Some of you remember, I once did an interview with him. Really cool story how he managed to get into the industry. Um, but yeah, those bearings, they are designed purely for those hubs. They are angular contact and adjustable. You can even service them yourselves. You can pop off the seals, a little metal seal, I'm pretty sure on the R45, you can pop them off, then you've got the rubber one underneath, pop that off, flush that out and re-grease them, repack them, they're good to go again. I've got to say, actually, the customer service from Chris King 2 has been absolutely excellent. I had a pair a few years ago, had a slight problem with them, and they solved it straight away. The quality of those Chris King products really is that good. Not the lightest things out there, I am going to say, and Chris King would also, you know, he would agree with me on that, but the quality of them, yeah, is really, really good. Right, next question then comes in from Tokyo Cyclist, who says, Hi John, I hope this question is relevant for this show. For my rides, especially on longer ones, I carry quite a lot of stuff. Water bottles, food, toolkit, pump, clothing, kitchen sink. No, I don't say kitchen sink. Uh, does it matter where most of the weight is placed on the bike with all this stuff? For example, towards the back of the bike in a saddlebag, or on the front in a handlebar bag? Or is it better overall to free up as much weight as possible off the bike and carry all of it in a backpack? For overall performance and safety, what do you recommend? Right, first of all, Tokyo Cyclist, absolute legend, watches my Instagram live videos every now and then and always comments on them. Right, okay, uh, firstly, I prefer not to carry anything on my handlebars. The reason being, you're limited then for actual uh, position where you put your hands on the bars because normally you have some like Velcro and like a, an attachment around the tops there so you can't necessarily hold on to the tops as comfortably as you would like to. And not to mention it makes steering a little bit sluggish, a bit heavy, a little bit more awkward and cumbersome, if you like. So I would always put it actually on the back of my bike. The reason I don't put it in a rucksack if I'm carrying loads of stuff is, well, it gives you a bit of a sore back, less aero probably as well, a big old lump coming out of your back, and gives you a sweaty back too. So uh, a big saddle bag, you can get them uh, that clamp onto the actual seat post and sometimes underneath the saddle rails as well, just to hold it, a little bit of stability. Alternatively, there's a brand out there 
uh, tail fin. They make a super light pannier rack as well, made out of carbon fibre, so you could have a couple on there. And I think they made one for the, the Transcontinental last year, I think it was as well, that was um, like the ones that attach on the seat post too. But yeah, I'd always go for something on the back, not on the front. Something you need to be aware about as well, some bikes actually have a weight limit, believe it or not, so you, you can't overload them with different bits of equipment. Just bear that in mind. Next up is oven cleaner. Oven cleaner. I, I, oven cleaner. Anyway, oven cleaner's question next. Uh, I'd like to see a video about integrated bars and stems. For example, the new Cannondale Super 6 Evo, Orbea Orca, Omex, Trek Madone. I know these bikes have split spacers, so you can shift the stem height without pulling everything apart. But if you were to lower the bar height, what do you do with the extra cable? Does it just sit in the frame, or would you actually need to cut the cable just to play with the bike fit, then replace the cable if you decide to put the bars back up again? Also, if playing with bike fit, can you put regular spaces on top of the stem so you can ride before deciding if and where you want to cut the steerer tube? If you make a video about this, I think it will actually be the only one on the whole internet. It probably would too, and also, Firstly, uh, these integrated bikes, you know, like fully internal routed cables and everything, they are pretty unique among themselves. Like they look pretty similar, but the, the routing and the systems and everything can vary from them. So right, let's tackle your first question about the cable inside of the frame. Generally, if a cable is inside of there, you don't need to worry about shortening it or anything. It's just inside of the frame, right? So it's not gonna, unless you raise your bars a lot, may you need to actually put a longer outer cable or inner cable inside, for instance. Most of these integrated bikes, like the ones you've said on there, they all use hydraulic disc brakes too. So having the extra cable in there, it doesn't affect the braking or anything like that. Um, you talk as well about having the uh, regular spacers on top of the stem. Yeah, you could do, providing of course that, you've, that you can get them for it. And some of them actually have integrated top cap covers too for the stems and everything to make them a little bit more aero. I think the BMC is one that does and I think the Giant as well. Um, sadly, when it comes to this sort of question, there isn't a one, uh, one answer covers all bikes because each one is individual. But essentially, yeah, you don't need to worry about having some extra cable or hose inside of the frame. That's absolutely fine. And in most cases too, you can put some extra spacers on top before you decide to cut down that steerer tube. Final one this week comes in from Josh Tipping, who says they're currently running an Ultegra 6800 short cage rear mech with a 28 tooth cassette. So 6800, the standard one with the 28 tooth everything there, normal. Uh, I bought a rear derailleur hanger extender to fit as I struggled to shift into the 28 tooth. I've tried increasing cable tension and aligning the limit screws, but to no effect. Do you think this will solve my problem? Will I need a new chain uh, due to needing more chain links? Thanks in advance. Uh, possibly you need some new, or a new chain really. You tend to do that rather than adding in some links because you can't really buy them separately, not that easily. Um, but I reckon you've probably missed the trick here. I think you probably need to try and set up your gears all over again. So it could well be that limit screws are absolutely fine, but I reckon that your high screw is unscrewed too much. And what it is, when you're changing gear, uh, the cable is taking up the slack or the, the extra overlap, if you like, from the rip, from where the upper pulley wheel is sat, and it's too far over to the right if you're looking at it from behind. So just have a look at that. So just screw it in you know a little bit until that pulley wheel is sat directly beneath the 11 tooth sprocket or 12 tooth sprocket undo your uh, your clamp cable clamp bolt pull through the cable nice and snug tighten it back up and then go through the gears that i reckon is probably what's happening there because a the derailleur hanger extender with a standard 28 uh, sorry yes 28 tooth sprocket and a short cage mech you shouldn't need that on there whatsoever, right? So uh, the only other thing could be is maybe your derailleur hanger at the moment is bent and it's bent outwards from the frame and it's not letting the, the rear derailleur move over far enough. That really is all I can think of with that one. Good luck with it, right? I hope I've been able to solve your bike problems and a happy new year to everybody out there. Remember, like I said at the start, if you've got a bike problem, leave it me down there in the comment section and I'll try and solve it in an upcoming episode. And also, why not check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And don't forget, subscribe to the channel and click the little notification icon so you get alerted each and every time we put a video live. And speaking about videos, for two more absolute crackers, how about clicking just down here and just down here. I've got to go and get ready now for the tech show.